Agile for Humans is brought to you by Audible.com. Get one free audiobook and a 30-day free trial at www.audibletrial.com forward slash agile. Over 180,000 titles to choose from for your iPhone, Android, Kindle, or MP3 player, including Scrum, The Art of Doing Twice the Work in Half the Time by Jeff Sutherland, and Crucial Conversations by Carrie Patterson. Visit www.audibletrial.com forward slash agile to enjoy your free audiobook today. Processes and tools dominate today's agile discussions. But we are devoted to the individuals and interactions that make it work. From the beginner to the veteran practitioner, we have something for you. Welcome to Agile for Humans. All right, welcome back to another episode of Agile for Humans. I'm your host, Ryan Ripley. Joining me tonight... The remotest Agile people I know, Mr. Mark Kilby and David Horowitz. Gentlemen, how are you doing tonight? Doing great, Ryan. Great. So the listeners, many of you will remember Mark Kilby from episode one, joined us on the very first episode of Agile for Humans, has had a great conversation with us on that inaugural episode. He's now come back to help us have a conversation around remote teams and retrospectives with remote teams, two very difficult topics mashed into one. Uh, Mark is co-founder of, I think, Agile Orlando, a noted Agile consultant from uh, multiple companies all over the country, a noted Agile speaker most recently at the big conference, Agile 2015, where he, sp- or where he has spoken on that multiple times, I believe. All-around great guy in the community and... Uh, someone that this show is proud to call a friend. So, Mark, thanks for joining us. Oh, and thanks for having me on again, Ryan. And, and wow, what an intro. Thanks so much. <laughs> yeah. David, so you are the CEO of Retrium. You've reached out uh, into the marketplace to solve a very critical problem. I want you to explain it because I think uh, you've put together a very interesting story about uh, your passion, your brand, your company, and I think you could do it far better than I could. Yeah, great. First of all, thanks for having me, Ryan. Really appreciate it. I'm a big fan of the show and really excited about being on. Uh, so as you mentioned, I'm the CEO and co-founder of Retrium, and we make software that enables distributed teams to run effective retrospectives, or at least that's what we hope. Uh, and so I came from to solve this problem from a pain point that I had myself which was that I was what I like to call a poor man's agile coach at a very large, uh, big, big bank, international bank, that was trying to move away from traditional waterfall towards agile, and our development teams were distributed. And as you probably can imagine, there's a lot of pain in trying to move to a, a new culture into agile. But among the bigger problems that we had was running good retrospectives. And Mark, uh, you probably, I would guess, would agree with me that kind of retrospectives are the core of Agile, that Agile is all about continuous improvement. And if you aren't continuously improving, then you're not Agile. And how do you continuously improve? It's through the retrospective. So it really bothered me when I was in this Agile coaching position that my teams weren't able to run these retrospectives very effectively. And I started thinking, well, why is that? And is there a solution out there? And if not, why isn't it public? Uh, why isn't there a solution? So, Mark, I reached out to you pretty early on to try to pick your brain a little bit about this problem. And you know, you kind of told me pretty quickly this is a major issue in oh, the yeah. industry. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so that's my passion, what we're trying to solve. Um, and I really, really think that if we can do that successfully, then the distributed teams that exist today will become a lot more productive. Yeah. Well, and, and I think. What what's critical for and while I'm I'm fond of Retrium, uh, what I'll say is, I, I think what's critical is you felt the pain. You know, you've you've yeah. been in that Scrum Master that coach role where you was like, how do I make this work? And and that's really the the uh, the biggest challenge of distributed teams. Now, I've had many successes in in getting distributed teams to work together. Uh, as a matter of fact, I I came off the road as a consultant to work. Uh, for my current company and now an internal coach at Sonatype, primarily for the challenge of working with 100% distributed Agile teams right now. So we have four different teams all running Scrum um, and, and other teams as well, uh, some running uh, Kanban, but they are all functioning just about as well 
as any of the co-located teams that I have ever worked with. And I think part of that's the, the technology and the tooling. But I think there's more than that involved. Uh, I, I think the, the, the influence of Agile has been a big part of that, mm-hmm. uh, that people are realizing they have to collaborate on a frequent basis and they have to find a way to get feedback on it frequently. So it's, it's looking for how do we get those feedback loops, whether it's from each other or systems, whatever. But I, I think, I think the, there's that convergence of the technology, agile influences, and attitudes of people as well. Yeah, working remote. Yeah, I think you you touched on something really important, which is to me at least, if you don't get culture and you don't get relationships right, it doesn't matter what tools you pick. And you know, as a tool owner, I'll be the first one to own up to that statement, right? So culture comes first, but mm-hmm. it is also true, I think, that if you have tools that can help you build that culture and build the relationships necessary to be an effective team, then that is very much an enabling factor. If you don't have those good tools, it's hard to become a good team in terms of culture and in terms of relationships and trust and empathy. You know, video chat, which in today's world is, seems relatively simple, is actually not, in my opinion. Yeah. You, know? uh, you lose a lot through video chat. So how do you overcome some of those challenges uh, with your teams, Mark? Because you said you're so effective, right? So I, I want to know, I want your, I want your lessons. <laughs> Uh, have a really big toolbox, essentially, is, is one of the things. Uh, so, you know, you were talking about uh, video chat in particular. Uh, so we actually use several different tools for video chat because you never know when one system is going to have an issue and can we quickly switch to another. Uh, so, so I'll mention a few other tools here that we happen to use, but, you know, not plugging any particular ones, but some days it's join me. Because we can pull up, you know, a, a meeting screen, but as well, we can pull video up these days and join me. Or if it's one to one, we might switch to HipChat video or Google Hangouts. Or it, and actually, we don't tend to use Skype that much because because of the other tool sets we have. Um, but it's it's having always having a backup way to connect, a backup way to communicate mm-hmm. as part of that. Um, so now that you've uh, noted all of David's main competitors, let's uh, <laughs> let's move forward. No, and, and I think uh, it's an important question that, that David brought up because it, it is a pain point, you know. And so, Mark, be having success in that, you know, you you really talked about the end state, David. I was wondering if you would lay out kind of that painful state that you noted that initially urged you into the world of entrepreneurship. Yeah. So, like I said before, the, to me, the core of Agile, the key of Agile is continuous improvement. And the way that you do that is through the retrospective. Now, with all of the co-located teams that I've been a part of, one of the best ways to run an effective retrospective is through really good facilitation. You can't just sit everyone down around a table and say, okay, guys, let's chat and hope that you're going to come up with the key pain points that the team is experiencing and not just the pain points, but also the plan to move forward. Um, this is a, has to be a structured conversation. And so you know, typically you can read you know, Esther Derby and uh, Diana Larson's book, um, which is a, a great book about retrospectives, in my opinion, kind of the Bible of how to run a good retrospective with lots of different phases um, and different ways of structuring the conversation. Really recommend it. Um, but in, in a nutshell, what you end up with is a toolkit of facilitation techniques, uh, things like four L's or Mad Sad Glad, or Lean Coffee, uh, or an appreciations retrospective. I could go on and on. The problem with a distributed team, and this is the pain point that I was facing, was that it's really hard to run those techniques when you don't have physical items to use, like flip charts and sticky notes and markers and things. It's really hard to replicate that environment. Uh, And so most of the time when I was in this kind of poor man's agile coach role, we just sat around a, a video chat and talked. And we got nowhere. And it was the most frustrating experience I've ever had uh, as an Agile coach. And it kind of lit a fire in me and said, you know what? This is not just a problem for me. This is a problem industry-wide. And then that in combination with this trend towards being distributed. You know, it seems to me, and Mark or Ryan, correct me if you think that I'm wrong on this, but more and more teams are becoming distributed. Uh, as we speak. And the future of work to me is distributed work. It's a work from where you are, when you want type of environment. 
And the combination of those two things really said, hey, I got to, if no one else is solving this problem, someone has to, right? And I want to be that guy. So that's kind of what lit the fire and maybe jump off the deep end <laughs> and go for it. Yeah. And I think your, your observation there is spot on, especially when you look at some of the more successful internet companies today. You know, I, I think of uh, Basecamp, which was formerly known as 37 Signals. Mm -hmm. This is the uh, the epitome uh, of excellence in the software industry, in my opinion. This is a small company. I think they have, you know, last I looked, around 40 maybe at the most uh, people. They all work distributed. They have a Chicago office, but, you know, half the time their co-founders in Europe, half their programmers are, are spread across the Midwest, East Coast, West Coast. They're all distributed. They all do brilliant work. They manage to pull it off as a team. And I think that's the model that's going to eat a lot of lunches of these traditional monolithic massive companies that are still expecting everyone to show up in a cubicle day after day. Mm -hmm. And so solving this tool problem uh, in many ways, I think, will create kind of the new business model and the new economy. So I think it is a very important uh, observation. And it's certainly a pain point, especially even in companies today. I mean, we all, I think, work in this new economy where, you know, our, our after hour support team is in a different country. And being able to catch up in the morning with that team before the handoff, how do you do that in the most effective way? How do you make sure that there's still a team sense or a, a team type atmosphere instead of uh, people you just hand off to and walk away from? Yeah. 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 So, so I'll, I'll jump in on this one. Um, so c coming back to what you know, David was poking me for, uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, it, it, I was thinking about this the other day about some of the things that we we do with our distributed teams now, and, and in a way it it almost comes back to that that first value of the Agile Manifesto, and I started thinking about you know it's it's more than left right you know individuals and interactions over processes and tools it's really you can think of it as a set of steps which works just as well for co-located teams teams as distributed teams, but you've got to be a little more intentional with the distributed team. So first, usually what I do is I get to know the individuals on the team. I want to understand why are they working this way? What's in it for them? So for instance, for me, for, for working remotely, I've still got kids in school. I still have young kids in school. And so I want to be close to them. I don't want to miss them growing up. I don't want to miss some of those daily events. And so being able to work from home each day gives me that flexibility. Um, but understanding what the different motivations are for every individual on the team is important. Then thinking about the interactions, um, and I'm doing a little collaboration with, uh, uh, Jim Benson, uh, from Modus Institute and some of the things that they've, they're putting together for distributed teams. Um, and I, I, I love how they focus on things, not only, uh, project charter and mapping at the value stream, but they also focus heavily on communications plan. So as a distributed team, you really have to think about how are we going to communicate? What's the frequency of different communications? When should we expect certain communications? Because you're not going to bump into each other in the hallway. Yeah, you might see each other on, on chat or, or something, but be really talking about how do we need to connect with each other? What time zones or how far are we spread out in time zones? And how do we need to connect? Uh, an example of that is... We have different communications channels, as, as I mentioned before, and we have backups for when those primaries fail because we want to connect daily. But there's also some times where you, you need to have some casual communications as well. So one of the things we focus on is uh, being intentionally social at work. So we have, uh, we have some social chat channels. Uh, one's called the lounge. And so in the lounge, you can talk about anything. You can talk about what you saw on TV last night. You can share uh, vacation photos, whatever. And there's a few groups that do this. Uh, so Atlassian uh, has written about this. Um, I, think, I think the folks at Basecamp uh, and, and WordPress do something similar to that. Um, we, we also read how Salesforce has a, a chat channel. I forget what they call it, but basically uh, it's a rant channel. And so if, you, if you're really upset about something or someone – you go into the rant channel and, you, and just whatever you need to say, you know, goes uh, and, and nobody judges you by that. So we've experimented with that. That one hasn't been as popular for us, but it's 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 experimenting with different ways to communicate. Uh, so you focus on individuals, interactions, and then really start looking at processes and tools. 
But if you if you don't look at how you're going to connect the people together, uh, kind of going back to what David was saying about focusing on on the culture, because if you don't do that, you're you're just a collection of strangers. You're not a team. You're not a company. You're just sort of this random collection. Um, and we and just as a as a side note, David and I are going to be participating in a, in a very interesting conference here next month in uh, in Germany uh, called the the Distributed Agile Teams or the Flock. Uh, I guess the uh, distributed agile teams flock, and we we've got a collection of folks that have very different ways of working in distributed teams. So I'm excited to be doing a workshop there, but I'm even more excited to be talking more with David and other folks who are looking at some of these different ways of connecting people so they can work effectively. Yeah, and, and Mark, I would I would just like to echo what you just said about the need to focus on building a team and not just being a random collection of strangers. I mean, I couldn't agree more with that statement. The idea of bumping into someone in a hallway if you're co-located, and, you know, if you ask yourself, well, why is that so important? What is it about randomly bumping into someone that's so critical? Yeah. And, you know, because it seems kind of superfluous at first, you're there to do work, but randomly bumping into someone and saying, hey, let's do coffee or let's make a lunch date allows you to build a connection with that individual. Yeah. And you know, what I've found when I've worked on distributed teams is that unless you do that intentionally, it's very easy to lose empathy for other people on your team and think yeah. of people who are not in the same physical location as you as just resources. And mm-hmm. when they're not delivering something out on time where you haven't heard from them in a while, you start making assumptions very easily that, hey, they're not working hard or what's wrong with those people. Yeah. But it's not those people. It's us. We're a team. And if you have a good relationship with everyone, then you can easily or more easily rather get past some of those inclinations that we all have. Let's be honest. right? We're, we're all humans. We all have the tendency to do, do that and assign blame. So it's really critical What I like to say is that you can't just be distributed. You have to focus on being good at being distributed. Otherwise, you know, the cost of being distributed is far outweighs the benefits. Um, And then in terms of the benefits of being distributed, though, I just kind of like make to make my pitch about it a little bit, because I think people have a bad taste in their mouths a lot of times from experiences with distributed teams where. Oh, yeah, I've been there. Right. (laughs) Me too. (laughs) Yeah, it's all over. And it doesn't have to be that way. I think one of the reasons why people tend to say, oh, I don't want to be distributed is because strategically for a a long time, the reason that teams became distributed was to save on cost. Mm -hmm. And that meant outsourcing. And while that can be effective, I think, Mark, what you and I are talking about in terms of being distributed is let's hire the best talent regardless of where it is. And that's not to save cost. That's to find the right people. So when you say, hey, we're going to be a distributed team, you have to step back and say, well, why? What's the goal of being distributed? And as long as it's to to hire the best people and to build the best team and not to save money, then it's a great choice. And then it also means that you're going to want to focus on being good because the people you're working with are good. And that's an empowering situation to be a part of, I think. Yeah. It's also, I think, horrifying to traditional companies, though, that when you hire a remote team, they have the ultimate mobility and flexibility. So as the economy moves towards a remote work environment, it's no longer difficult for me to uh, switch companies and switch roles, right? Because now if I want to go work for a a different company in my field or in my industry, I may have to move to a different state. And there's hassles and there's considerations and there's proximity to family and there's all these ties and things that, that keep people rooted in their communities. Well, if I can work from, you know, Fort Wayne, Indiana... And work for anywhere or work for anyone anywhere in the world, I now have the ultimate type of mobility, right? And you could probably do that switch in about an hour or two, by the way. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) Right? It's it's a a few forms, a drug test, and uh, you're with a new company. Boom. Done. Yeah. 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 We should pass it. <laughs> you know, I think in the long run, that's probably good for the industry. It's going to up the quality of what companies have to offer employees and what employees have to deliver to companies to retain them. Yeah. So that's not a bad thing. Well, no, and I, I totally agree. It, it's, it's, a, it's a great uh, shift that I think that the next few generations, I think that these, you know, I, I don't use the millennial term negatively, but I think as the millennials come up, I think they're going to demand, and that you're starting to see signs of this, I think, in the marketplace where they're demanding the different types of work environments yes. that companies are adapting and adjusting to. And I think this is one of those concessions that they're really saying, look, 
I want to live in this location, but I want to work for this great company. If you want my talent, this has to be an option. Yeah. 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 Well, so yes. And, uh, <laughs> improv skill right yeah. there. Um, I, I think it's, I think it's a, a mind shift for the companies, but it's also a mind shift for, for those of us who are, you know, in the trenches as well. Um, so uh, I, I can't remember exactly, but there was something that David was saying earlier um, that reminded me, we were talking about the intentionality of, of working together. Uh, and you've got to be intentional in, in how you connect with people. And so we don't, uh, and, and maybe it's, it's my generation because I'm on the, on the borderline of a couple generations, but uh, growing up, you didn't have to be intentional to start a conversation. You just hang out with folks. Uh, but when you're in a distributed environment, you have to be intentional to connect with people. You have to be intentional to share a little bit about you, which some people that they're very apprehensive about that. Uh, I mean, we, we have a lot of introverts in our, in our company. Shockingly uh, engineers, shocking. introverts, come on. <laughs> yeah. Distributed and software. Hey, uh, but you know, as a, as a coach or scrum master or really any, any role where you're in an agile leadership role, you, you still have to find ways to connect with them and help them to connect. So, um, one thing I often do is, uh, you know, I'll, I'll throw out small jokes or, or quotes, or sometimes I'll end a meeting in an unusual way. So, uh, for those who, who know the, uh, show top gear in the UK, one of their favorite ways to close the show is, and I'll not bombshell. And, and so <laughs> sometimes I'll throw that out in a meeting and I'll usually, I'll get a chat right after the meeting. Hey, was that from top gear? I love that show. And, and so just by throwing out little things like that, you make a connection with that person. And so you spend a little time afterwards chatting with them, getting to know them, just based on throwing out some stupid line like that. You know what? It's funny. I ended a staff meeting today with, and there's no way Glenn survived. And, uh, <laughs> and I think half the room was in an uproar within two seconds. But, uh, and the rest, and the rest so, wanted to know, what are you guys talking about? What are you talking about? <laughs> Yeah. No, most of the group knew, but uh, you're right, Mark. It's it's a memorable way to to end a meeting. It endears people to you, and it sparks a quick little. It's the meeting after the meeting, which is yes. which was one of the questions I would, was going to have for you guys. Because part of being a, a co-located team is that you can have this meeting, you can linger in the boss's office, you can linger in your peer or colleague's office, and have that quick thirty second or, or a minute or however long it is. Uh, meeting after the meeting where you say, hey, what did you think about this? Hey, are you doing all right? How are your kids? Yeah. Or, uh, or meeting before the meeting. Exactly. Yeah, sometimes we'll do that with our stand-ups where there'll be a few of us that'll gather yeah. minutes early and we'll just kind of check in with each other. And that's just, you know, th those times before and after are just as critical. So I'm going to slightly disagree with both of you here and do a yes but. Oh, good. <laughs> um, I think what you're saying... All right, someone mute that mic. Mute that mic. Right, right. Um, <laughs> I think what both of you are saying is true for a certain type of person, but you have to be careful because when you have introverts working on a distributed team, there is a tendency for those people to become even more introverted because it's easy to hide behind the technology. Oh yeah. And you have to ask yourself though, is that good or bad? And without making any value judgments here, because of course it depends on context and so on, Introverts can get very uncomfortable with unstructured conversation and jokes and uh, any sort of, you know, poking at you uh, for any reason. And it, there's a certain, certain amount of structure that introverts like to conversation. Mm -hmm. And so ending a, a, a talk or a, a chat with something that is funny for extroverts might actually not appeal to the other half of people on your team and might make them feel less like they're part of the group. So you have to be a little careful, I'd say. So, so I've got a story for you. Okay. So uh, when I joined Sonatype and one of the first teams I worked with, um, I, as, as connecting with the individuals, I, I made a point of getting in some kind of video call with each person on the team, uh, of which many of my introverts were like, why are we doing this? <laughs> yeah. And I said, listen, you don't have to talk. I said, I just want to kind of get to know you. I want to give you a little bit of my background and any questions you want to ask me up front. Uh, usually, uh, there was one question, what are you going to change? 
because they knew my background as a natural coach. And, and so the answer was always the same was my goal is not to change anything. I said, my goal is to help you guys where you feel you need help. So with that, where do you guys feel you need help? And the one thing that came out of this was, oh, our meetings are just terribly long. I said, oh, really? Interesting. So tell me about that. And so they told, told me how dra- they, they dragged on. They were unstructured. And so picking up on that, I, uh, I kind of went hyper-efficient. I turned, the, I turned the efficiency knob up to 11. And, uh, and uh, we, we, we started, ended up with our meetings becoming like 20-minute meetings eventually. Mm-hmm. And, and so then there'd be times where I'd, I'd end the meeting early. I go, Oh, I'm sorry, guys. I ended the meeting early. I hope that's okay. And then that, that would be it. And, and so with that, then I started adding some of the jokes, but brief, kept keeping them very brief just to make some connections. And I found some of the introverts starting to toss some jokes out too. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So. Yeah. So there you go. And yeah. you, you mentioned kind of time boxing, which I like a lot as a technique. Oh, yeah, yeah oh, time yeah. boxing. It's really critical. Um, so one of the things that we're doing with Retrium is we have this, these toolbox of techniques where you can pick one like Mad, Sad, Glad, which has certain phases to it. So the first one is private brainstorming. You get a, a chance to record your ideas down when no one else can see what you're doing. And then you move into dot voting where you can vote on the ideas that resonate the most with you. Uh, not just your own, but anyone. And then you can move into discussion where you can talk about those ideas in a prioritized way and come up with action items to move forward. And the nice thing about having a flow that's predefined like that is that everyone on the team knows this is where we are in the meeting, this is what's coming, and this is what we have left to do. And as a result of that, you can keep the conversation going instead of letting it run on and on. I mean, how many conference calls have you been on that they just drone on and on forever and yeah you just you you end up putting it on mute and you play games on your phone because you're so <laughs> bored it's awful i don't think i've ever been on a good conference call <laughs> they're really terrible so having that facilitation piece as long with time boxing to move the conversation forward at a good pace is really critical especially for a distributed team for co-located also but especially yeah. for distributed well, so, so I'll add to that. The one thing I discovered is, as part of maintaining connections, even in a meeting, is uh, back channels are critical. So I, I always like to have a chat channel running, which some people go, oh, my gosh, no, that's going to distract people. People are going to be distracted anyway. Uh, but if you, can, if you can focus them on a, on a back channel when they can't focus on the main part of the meeting or maybe they can't break in and realize they have another way to get into the meeting, uh, then, then I've, I've found that as there is better engagement. There's still a tendency to do some multitasking, and I don't get too um, spun up by that. But using time boxes, using back channels, there's a way to keep the meeting moving. And I, I emphasize to, to, the, to the teams, like, all right, if this is dragging on, then, then let's shorten it. Let's find a way to change this, and we'll do a short retrospective on the meeting right there. It's like, all right, what do you want to do different next time so this doesn't drag on? Mm-hmm. So. How do you guys handle group learning? You know, when a, when a team learns together, they grow together. When a team's co-located, they typically share lessons quickly. You can hear the conversations over the wall. You can uh, pick up on things and jump in quickly. You know, clearly that would be uh, at least more difficult in a distributed environment. But what have you guys seen as far as tips, tricks, or tools that allow you to make sure the team learns and grows together? So I hate to start with a tool because usually that's not the place to start, but I'm going to throw one out anyway in this, in this case, which is Sokoko. Um, big fan of Sokoko. So if you haven't heard of Sokoko, it's basically a tool that allows you to recreate a office environment online. So you have an office map with closed door offices and open office layout if you wanted. You have the water cooler, you have the bathroom, and you can move your avatar from place to place on the map. Um, to indicate whether you're busy, you know, or whether you're talking to someone or in a meeting. And the reason I bring that up in response to your question is that um, unlike, you know, what we're doing right now, where we're kind of chatting in a free-form way over uh, Skype, Sokoko allows you to recreate that sense of, hey, we're going to chat kind of in this back channel after the meeting in this room over here, or we can, we're going to stay back in this conference room now, even though the meeting's over, to keep chatting about it. And the visual sense that you get from those avatars being in different rooms is really useful uh, because it, it lets the team know what you're up to and what you're doing. Um, so it's not 
the fact that you're using Sococo that helps. It's what Sococo does for you. It's the value Sococo provides, which is recreating that office space a bit um, that can help you learn with others. Yeah. So I think that tool is very interesting. Another advancement that I think would need to happen, or maybe it has happened and you guys can clue me in, because like I said, my, my current experience right now is in a, a very much a co-located team. There are a few remote individuals that that we have on the team, but for the most part it is co-located, would be the the hindrance in pair and mob programming. And so I'm wondering, I know that we now have uh, online IDEs, mm -hmm. which are, are fairly interesting, but have you seen a solution that allows, you know, two, two video windows, uh, one IDE, ability to, to hand off control, and uh, the ability for pair or mob programming to truly take place, in a collaborative way with remote users. And if not, then that's product number two, David. Yeah, <laughs> after I sell this one for a billion, right? <laughs> there you go. Yeah, mob programming, no. That would be interesting. Yeah. Even just pair. So yeah. let's take it down. Let's dial it back a bit. For the ability to pair program, which I think is an interesting and, and sometimes necessary option for, for remote people, just the ability to, to recreate that experience. Yeah. Well, the, the one I've heard the most about as far as pair programming is uh, Screen Hero, which was, uh, yeah, I was just checking here on online. Yeah, so they were recently purchased by Slack. Uh, but uh, I haven't used it personally, but I, I know some of our teams have used Screen Hero for pair programming, and they thought it was fantastic. They, they thought it was a very uh, smooth transition from one person to another, uh, being able to see each other's uh, what they were they're working on, being able to comment in real time. Uh, I, I'm not sure how the integration with Slack is, but that's the one I hear about the most as far as uh, pair programming tools. I know there's others out there. I just don't know the names off the top of my head. Yeah, the, the other thing I'd mention with that, I mean, it's not really pair programming, but it is about sharing knowledge. Is if your team's distributed, you can have this concept of rotating remote pairing. Where, you know, this week I'm paired with Mark, and that means that as we're working, we're making sure that we're knowledge sharing, uh, we're making sure that we're working very closely together, and what I'm doing and the, what I'm learning about the requirements that we have or about the software that we're building or our stakeholders or whatever is shared very closely with Mark this week, and the same is true in reverse. And then next week we, we shift and we rotate so that two more people are paired together. And by doing that, you can both build relationships with that person you're paired with um, by you know, just chatting or talking about whatever you did this past weekend, but also share knowledge about the work that you're doing as well. So it's not pair programming, but it is pairing in a different sense. Well, and I was going to say, you can, you can take that pairing concept uh, and apply it in many different ways. So something I've often done as uh, you know, another, another secret Secret tip there uh, in meetings is use the buddy system. So if I know I've got some distributed folks and co-located folks, I'll ask, hey, you know, I'm, I'm facilitating the meeting, folks. It's, I'm going to be really busy trying to make sure things are, are, are going right. You can help me by connecting with one of these remote people and being in a chat window with them and just making sure they can connect with us or if they miss anything, they can talk to you as their buddy say, hey, what did they just say? Okay. And then, and then let us know so we can stop and go back because others might have missed it as well. So I've used that buddy system many, many times in many different ways. And it helps those remote people feel more connected when you have some co-located co folks with you in the room. So David, maybe you can tell us a little bit more about your, your retrospective tool. I it's an interesting concept to me because, again, we're trying to learn remotely as a team. It sounds like you have different modes and models that you can follow. So you can do the mad, glad, sad. You can do, uh, it sounds like, a few other of the, the popular models that we read about and know about. But, but what is the, the value proposition of the tool that, that your company provides? And, and what kind of benefits and improvements in remote collaboration have you seen your tool bring to to teams and, and organizations? Yeah, so uh, you know, obviously, I'm glad you asked that question, but I don't want this to be an advertisement because this is really just a, you know talking about distributed agile, and my tool is one part of that. Um, but since you asked, uh, so <laughs> <laughs> well, no, I think it's important. So, so, uh, th and this is actually so this is maybe this is a little uh, inside baseball for some of the listeners, but as as a podcast host, 
you know, such as myself, where the podcast is focused on individuals and interactions, uh, I want to be careful about uh, promoting uh, tools. But in this case, it's a tool designed to enhance the, yeah. the interactions. Well, right. And it's about the people. And so I, the reason we ask about this, and the reason I was very interested in talking to David here is because he has a tool that's focused on, on people the, and the interactions that they have and, and creating a positive outcome and environment for those interactions to occur. And so I think that's the important note on, on, on a tool discussion. So it's not really an advertisement. What I'm asking David really is, uh, what can your tool do to bring people together? Yeah. So there are really four things. And these are all based on a article that a professor, his name is Dr. Tomas Chamaro Pramusic, uh, published in the Harvard Business Review. And he identified four different problems that teams that are trying to brainstorm face. They are social loafing, and I'll describe what these are in a minute. So social loafing, social anxiety, regression to the mean, and production blocking. So let's start with the beginning. So social loafing. Um, so I love the word social loafing or the term because it really, it kind of resonates with me. So how many times have you been in a meeting where someone's talking too much and they go on and on and on? And as a result of that, uh, you know, you don't feel like you have the time or the space to contribute and you just kind of loaf. You're there for the ride. You're not really contributing. You're just, your presence is there, but your presence also is not there, right? So that's a social loafing problem in terms of communication made even harder by distributed. Right. That's the first one. The second problem is social anxiety. So uh, people who are introverts, very hard to contribute to a free flowing conversation like we talked about before. I feel very uncomfortable with that. Um, when you're distributed, very easy to hide behind technology. The third problem is regression to the mean. It's the idea that when you have lots of different people in a room contributing ideas to a conversation, if the first person who throws out an idea, on average, it'll be an average idea. On average, it's not going to be the best idea or the worst. It'll be kind of just an average idea. And once you've thrown that idea out there, everyone else's thought processes are anchored to that idea, that the rest of the conversation is based on that first idea that was thrown out to the group. That's a problem because you're not going to end up with the extreme good idea or the extreme bad. So that's an issue. And then the fourth one is production blocking, which is that if you, only one person can talk at one time, then everyone else is sitting there twiddling their thumbs. And that's a big waste of time for a lot of people in the meeting. So those are four problems. So at, at Retrium, we, when we were building the software, we we're trying to solve all four of those things. So let me quickly go through and how we did that. So with social loafing, um, we have this phase called private brainstorming where everyone can contribute their own ideas to the board uh, immediately as soon as they enter the meeting. So you don't have to wait for someone else to talk. And the goal here is to try to encourage people to participate in the meeting uh, and not um, feel like they can just attend without really attending. So private brainstorming is our answer to social loafing. Social anxiety, um, because you write things down on the board in Retrium before you talk about them verbally, people who are more introverted can communicate in a way that they're more comfortable with. That's really useful. Um, with regression to the mean, again, because people are contributing all up front at once and you don't actually have any exposure to anyone else's ideas before you have a chance to contribute, um, as a result of that, you... Uh, are not anchored to ideas that are on the board or on the table. You have your own ideas. You think for yourself. That's really critical. And then the last one, production blocking. So again, you're all contributing all at once before you start talking about the ideas in a prioritized way. So there's no production blocking involved. The communication is enhanced because everyone is involved and active in the meeting. So I think that kind of sums it up. Um, four of those problems, we tried to solve them all. And the focus is to enable communication rather than to distract from the communication. That's the fundamental premise of Retrium. And I think any tool that doesn't focus on that is really missing the point, ultimately. It sounds like a really innovative way to attack this problem, so I really appreciate you walking through that. Yeah. Um, it is a tough nut to crack. It is a, you know, for a podcast like this, like you said, we're talking over Skype. The tool kind of falls to the background. We can all see each other and we have a conversation. To replicate that experience in a retro, I think, is a game changer. So I, I wish you luck with that. Thank you. And I hope you're successful with it because it's a tool that I need. So <laughs> I, would, I would love to, and I think there's a lot of agile teams out there and not necessarily just Scrum, but Kanban and Lean. They all have the need to, to enhance their feedback loops. No matter what flavor of Agile you're doing, you've got to talk to other people and figure out what went wrong, what went right, and how to improve. And like you said, continuous improvement is at the heart of what we're doing. 
you know, if you guys get this right, it really can empower these distributed teams to get the maximum benefits of Agile with the maximum flexibility of remote work. So it really is interesting and great work that you're doing, David. Awesome. Really appreciate it. Yeah. And yeah. yeah and I want to, I want to jump in there too, Ryan. Um, so uh, having, having played a little bit with Retrum and used it uh, with my teams a couple of times, I can certainly do some of the same exercises in like a Google doc. But the difference is as the facilitator, I have to work a lot harder. I, I have to I, I have to get the Google Doc set up if I want to hide portions of of the the document because I, I want the structured conversation and I don't want them jumping ahead in different parts. I want them working together on certain parts. I, I have to work very hard to structure that properly in in a uh, more basic sharing tool like a, like a Google Doc. That the part that really excited me about Retrium was. That there is there there is more of a um, facilitation aids, I guess, in in the tool set. Uh, the the one thing though that uh, we all need to be cautious of though is not relying too much on the tools. And this is not a this is not uh, a shot at any particular tool, uh, but that's also why I I tend to have a few tools in the toolbox because uh, you know Mr. Murphy of Murphy's Law is on every team. And so you've got to be ready to shift gears as a facilitator so that if the conversation goes in a very different direction, it may not fit the particular activity you've got set for them. Uh, so there's some things I can, I can do in certain tools and things I can't do. So sometimes I have to shut one tool down and bring another one up so I can maybe help them with where that conversation is going. So that, that's something to be aware of, too. And that really lies at the heart of Agile anyway, which is yep. that if you've identified a problem, fix it. Yep. Right? And so I couldn't agree more. Uh, Retrium does a lot of things well. It's not perfect. I'll be the first one to admit that. We have a long way to go to make it an even better tool. So uh, the goal always has to be the continuous improvement and not the tool. Uh, and we're hoping that the tool helps provide the continuous improvement. But again, go back to culture, go back to building trust and empathy. That's the core of everything. And if you can't get that, the tool won't matter. And, and I think that's a, a great spot for us to look and see that along with being at the core of Agile, continuous improvement is important. So are our time boxes. And I think for this conversation, guys, we have hit our time box. I just want to say I really appreciate, appreciate you guys coming on because, like I said, Mark, you are at the forefront of Agile teams working remotely. David, you're working on cutting-edge tools where I think – you guys have your hearts in the right place. And so I think, I hope that shine through to the listeners that, you know, you, you want the culture and you want the individuals and you want the, the, the feedback and the interactions, all that to be at the forefront and the tool to be behind that. And I think that's a great outlook for a company to take. So I really appreciate you telling us your story as well. At this point in the show, as we wrap up, we uh, offer the guests an opportunity to uh, plug anything else that they have going on, any events you're speaking at, ways that people can get a hold of you. So Twitter handles, um, websites, anything that you've got going on. Mark, we'll start with you. What would you like to plug? How can the listeners continue the conversation with you? Okay. Well, so as I mentioned, uh, both David and I are, are going to be doing workshops at the Distributed Agile Teams Flock in Berlin uh, we'll, I'll, I'll send you the link so you can get it in the show notes cause it's a long one. So I'm not even going to try to rattle it off here. Uh, but, uh, there's just a really interesting group of, of speakers that are gathering there. So I would highly recommend that if you can't be in Berlin in, in mid November, uh, you can certainly reach me on Twitter on, uh, as M Kilby, M K I L B Y. Uh, I'm on there often, uh, and, uh, via my website, uh, markkilby.com. David, how about you? Yeah, so I think you heard about my tool already. So it's retrium.com, R-E-T-R-I-U-M.com. We also have a blog there. That's blog.retrium.com. Uh, and on Twitter, I am D-S underscore Horowitz. So D as in David, S as in Seth underscore Horowitz, H-O-R-O-W-I-T-Z. And the Retrium Twitter account is R-E-T-R-I-U-M-H-Q. So it's Retrium HQ. Um, and then lastly, in terms of the distributed Agile team camp, I'm just going to make one more plug for that because it really is going to be an 
awesome, awesome set of people who are running workshops. It is a no PowerPoint workshop session. So it is all going to be interactive and a lot of fun. And I can't wait personally to learn from all of the experts who are going to be there. It's a fantastic group of people. So if you can at any way possible be there in Berlin, November 19th and 20th, highly recommend it. It's going to be really, really neat. And I'm your host, Ryan Ripley. I am available on Twitter at Ryan Ripley. Uh, the, the website is ryanripley.com. We'd love your feedback. If you are enjoying Agile for Humans, please tell your friends. Pre please spread the word. If you feel so inclined, we'd love to hear your reviews and comments on either iTunes or on the blog site. Your feedback helps us make this better. You are, you are our continuous feedback loop. So please you know, give us the comments. Give us your thoughts. What can we do to better serve you as the listener? Uh, that's what we're about here. We're not getting rich. We're just enjoying having conversations with friends, and uh, we're hoping that they help you. And so... That's what we're about. Your feedback is, is crucial and important. And just thank you for being here. Uh, the fact that uh, we have a, a, a growing and significant audience, is, uh, it's humbling to me. It's humbling to you know, the other guests and, and co-hosts. It's, it's just a great, uh, great thing that's going on here. And we really want to just thank you, the listener, for being there and for, for sharing the word and, and for clearly uh, spreading out uh, the podcast. So, that's all that we have for this week, everybody. Thanks, and have a good night. Thanks for listening to Agile for Humans. Let's keep the conversation going. Drop us a question on Twitter at Agile for Humans or visit agileforhumans.com. <laughs>